We're continuing our conversation today in the book of Acts. So if you'll take your Bibles and hold them up in the air, we'll say the prayer that we always pray as we begin this study. You ready? Dear Lord, thank you for your wonderful acts. And what you did then, would you do again? And what you did through them, would you do through us? In Jesus' name, amen. Now open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. Acts, the 17th chapter. I love that sound of turning pages. Imagine that you live on one side of a, a canyon, a sparse, dry canyon. Your side of the canyon is rodent-infested, tumbleweed-populated, dry, and arid. But the other side of the canyon is different than yours. You've never been there, but you can see the lush green hills. And you can hear the sound of bubbling brooks, waterfalls. And you, along with all of the other drylanders, desire nothing more than to leave your side of the canyon and cross over onto the other. But you can't. It's too far. The span between the two walls is simply too great. So what do you do? Well, you do what everyone else does on your side of the canyon. What your fathers did and their fathers did. What your, genera what your families have done for generations. You collect rocks. Your thinking is, if you get enough rocks, if you stack enough stones, that somehow, someday, you'll be able to build a bridge across from your side of the canyon to the other side. And so for the last few years, you have done what everyone does, and that is you've collected rocks, one stone after another. In fact, you've become quite a stone collector. You're pretty well known for all of your stones. You're proud of your stones. You stack your stones prominently where people can pass by and look at all your stones. You conduct stone collecting seminars. You wear a little stone around your neck. You count and label all of your stones. You're very proud of your stones. And you're so focused on stacking your stones that it never occurs to you to ask a couple of basic questions. How many stones do I need? How am I going to build this bridge? Which stones will work? Who's going to construct this and design this for me? You would think the most obvious questions would be asked, but you're so focused on collecting and stacking your stones that you never ask them. And so you're on the dry side of the canyon, longing for the lush side of the canyon, stacking stones, that you hope someday will turn into a bridge over which you can pass to the other side of the canyon. And then one day, you hear the news. Somebody built the bridge. Somebody built the bridge. You don't have to stack stones anymore. You don't have to collect rocks anymore. You don't have to be anxious or worried about getting across. The bridge is there. Just trust it and walk across. Many of the people who hear this news are thrilled, but not you. Not the rockmeister. Not the rock star. Because you take great pride in your rock. And you feel threatened to be told that all of that work that you have done is unnecessary. And that somebody else has done it for you. So you don't believe them. 
You don't believe them. What's more, you dismiss the existence of that bridge as absolute heresy. And if anybody believes in that bridge, you go after them. And you go from being a stone stacker to a stone thrower. This is what happened to Saul. Before he was Paul, the missionary apostle, he was Saul, the stone stacking religious zealot. He spent his whole life stacking stones. He grew up in a religious family. He was born into a religious tradition. He studied under the best religious thinkers of his day. And he determined what stones needed to be collected in order to cross over the archway from earth to heaven. How many stones were needed? How would the bridge be built? No one knew. But they collected their religious achievements like stones. And they stacked them up in great pride and pomp for everyone to see. They observed the law down to the minute detail. And they took great pride in everything that they accomplished. They were religious people. And Saul was the most religious of them all. And then came those Christians. Then came Peter and John, these uneducated Galileans. Stephen, that fiery preaching prophet, with this bizarre declaration that Jesus Christ had built the bridge, that the Messiah had come, and that his cross was really a bridge between earth and heaven over which we could pass. We could cross over on a, an archway of mercy and forgiveness. Many people were excited and they received it for what it was, gospel or good news. But there were a few, like Saul, who couldn't stomach the thought because their resume was their rocks. He had staked his life on his stack. And to be told that you don't need a stack of rocks, that somebody has already built the bridge, even though, by the way, you don't know exactly how it's all going to come together, was very offensive to them. In their mind, the relationship between humans and God was very simple. If I do this, God, then you have to do that. If I collect enough rocks... If I stack enough stones, if I keep enough religious traditions, if I do things right and get it in just a certain way, then you don't have a choice, God. I've done my part, now you do yours. And then these Christians come along and say, oh, it's not about what you do, but it's about what he did. And Paul, excuse me, Saul before he was Paul. Saul hated him. He hated Christians. He didn't just disagree with them. He just didn't just dislike them. He hated them. And Saul, the, the stone stacker, became Saul, the what? Stone thrower. And he went after him with a vengeance. And he would have been happy to annihilate every Christian and wipe Christianity off the face of the earth. But then something happened on the road to Damascus. Do you remember why he was going to Damascus? He was going to kill a few Christians, or at least put them in prison. But on the road to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him in the desert. He fell to the ground. And what he saw in that moment in the desert was so profound, so life-changing, that he made a 180 degree turn. He didn't say, okay, give me six weeks just to think about it. He didn't say, I need to go talk to some therapists about what I've seen. He literally went from being a stone stacker to being a Christ follower. 
He went from killing Christians to loving Christ and declaring Christ. His life was turned around from south to north, from left to right, from dark to light. What he was, he was no longer. And so we read that story and we think, what in the world did Paul discover? What was so profound about that Damascus Road moment that so changed him like it did? So much that we're still reading his words 2,000 years later. Well, he spent his life answering that question. And on one occasion, he answered that question with such clarity and brevity that it's worthy of our study today. It's in Acts chapter 17. And Paul has traveled to the city of Athens. The city of Athens. Athens boasted the rich philosophical tradition of the great thinkers of Greece, Socrates, and Plato, and, and Aristotle. If the first century had an Ivy League city, it was Athens. Athens is where the thinkers gathered. And we like to envision here Paul, the great thinker of the Christian faith, walking into this city of great thinkers. He enters the city alone. It's a solitary journey because his traveling companions, uh, Silas and Timothy and Luke, stayed behind in Philippi in the region of Macedonia to help the new church. So Paul travels by himself. He's changed his name now from Saul to Paul. He travels into the city of Athens. We like to envision this solitary servant entering the ancient city. He would have seen the dramatic Acropolis. He would have seen the Parthenon from afar and from up close. He would have walked the amphitheater of Mars Hill. But most of all, Paul would have seen the idols Look in Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, <clears throat> he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. William Barclay in his commentary says, It was said that there were more statues of the gods in Athens than in all the rest of Greece put together, and that in Athens it was easier to meet a god than a man. Innumerable temples and shrines and altars mark the city. Images of Apollos and Jupiter and Neptune and Venus and Bacchus. All the gods of Olympus. The statues were made of gold or silver or ivory or marble. It was a forest of idols. Everybody, it seemed, had an idol. Kind of like you have an occupation or a hobby. Everybody had a personal god they had localized their God there in Athens so they could serve him. And they had devised a system of service that would please their particular deity. So as Paul walked up and down the narrow streets of Athens, he could hear people mumbling and see them praying. And they were offering incense and lighting candles. And they were bowing and stooping before these gods, before these idols uh, that, they had, that they had made. For though the gods were different, the system or the strategy was the same. I will make you God, and I will ser serve you, I will worship you, and then you will save me and protect me. It was a very convenient religion. I make the God, and then the God protects and then saves me. It's a bizarre thought, isn't it? This whole thing of idol worship. It strikes our Western ears as very odd. You take gold or iron ore and you cast it in the furnace and you pull it out and you shape it and you hammer it and you pound it and you paint it and then you set it up and you decorate it and then you develop a way of worshiping this God. That God, that statue, has no input because that God has no brain. 
or voice. But you develop in your mind a system, a negotiation, a, a, a trade-off. I will worship you in this way, and in exchange, you have to save me. Paul was nauseated at the thought. That's literally what the term means there in Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. He was greatly distressed. The Greek word here is paroxino, from which the word per, per, paroxysm comes. Uh, the ancient medical books described a paroxysm or a paroxino as a seizure or epileptic fit. We might say that Paul was all shook up. He was just undone at what he saw. It's easy to see why. The idea is just stupid. It's foolish. How can a person worship what they create? How can the creator worship the created? The maker worship the mate or the maid. It doesn't make sense. And, and, and who is to think that we could create a system whereby which what we make can save us. It just doesn't make sense. So Paul thought it was foolish. But you know what? Paul also thought it was very familiar. Because he had done the same thing. Growing up in Tarsus, living in Jerusalem, a religious zealot. He had done so not, not with idols in Athens, but with the law in Tarsus, in, in Jerusalem. And he had developed a system, or he had followed a system that said, if we serve God, then God must save us. If we keep the law, if we observe the certain traditions and keep the sacrifices and collect the stones and accomplish the deeds, if we earn the merit badges, then God has to save us. We call this legalism. It's a legal transaction. If I do this, then God, you must do that even though my part may be self-created or ill-defined. Then God is obligated to save me. Paul knew this system in his nausea. So he couldn't be quiet. Verse 17. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and God's born Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Paul's teaching so amazed the Athenians that they gave him an invitation to come and speak on Mars Hill, which was the big gathering place of all the real thinkers and leaders. Paul accepted the invitation. And in verse 22, he gives his message. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to declare to you. Look at Paul's tact. He doesn't begin with his world, he begins with their world. He doesn't begin with his frame of reference, he begins with their frame of reference. He doesn't start off quoting the law or the words of Jesus. He enters their world and he speaks their vocabulary. And he says, there's a statue out there that doesn't have a name. I guess you put that one up for good measure. And this one, I'm going to tell you about. I know who this unknown God is. And he tells them two things about God that really will rock their world. Number one, we can't domesticate God. In other words, you can't confine him to a place. And number two, you can't negotiate with God. You can't work out one of these systems and say that's going to save you. We can't domesticate God. Look at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by hand. How absurd to think that you could take the eternal God who made the universe and get him to live in one little house however beautiful it may be, or to be confined to a statue. It's just foolish. But then look what he says. Not only can we not domesticate God, we can't negotiate with God. This is what Paul learned on the road to Damascus. He is not served by human hands. As if he needed anything. 
because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Now, what in the world is Paul saying? God cannot be served. Don't we talk about serving God all the time? Not in the sense that they were talking about serving God. You see, they were serving in order to be saved. Paul says it doesn't work like that. If we serve, it's not in order to be saved. It's because we are saved. And he takes their teaching and he flips it on his head. Now we still see large rivers of this kind of teaching today, even though we don't have the little statues. But we still have this mindset that says, if I do this, then God must do that. If I keep my nose clean, if I treat people nice, if I don't get in any trouble, if I pay my taxes, if I don't break the law, or at least don't break any big law, then I'm going to look up someday and I'm going to see God saying, okay, come to heaven. It's kind of an unwritten code. It's not found in any file cabinet or computer, but we just know it's there. Test me on this. Ask some of your friends. Do you think you're going to heaven? If they believe in heaven, if they believe there's a God, most people will say, well, yeah. Why? Well, because I'm a decent person. Because I'm a pretty good guy. Or because I've really never hurt anybody. Or because I'm better than Hitler. They'll find some way of saying, because I have done this, then guess what? God has to save me. He has to. We have this arrangement. We have this quid pro quo thing going. Don't you see? I do my part. He does his part. He's obligated to save me. Paul, who lived many years in the rock quarry of legalism, steps up there in Athens, right at the intersection of the two streets. I do this and God does that. And right at that corner, he says, hogwash. God cannot be served. God is not obligated. God does not negotiate. God is not in this business. You and all of your gods, I don't care how good you think you are. God cannot be served. You think that God is just a used car dealer? You walk up on the religious lot and you begin negotiating something with him? And you sign a contract and drive off in a Chevy of salvation? It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, Paul would say, your best works, the best days of your life, the most charitable deeds of your life, the greatest things you have ever done in God's economy are nothing more than dog poo-poo. Those are Paul's words. <laughs> Not mine. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. There it is. Then he goes on to say, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight years old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable but now I consider them worthless. Why? Because of what Christ has done. All my stones are pretty puny 
when I look over and I see the big, beautiful bridge that he has built. Worthless. Now, if you take a lot of pride in your religious activities, if you feel self-sufficient, if you feel religiously accomplished, then you might, like Saul, take offense at these words. But on the other hand, if you feel like you stumble more than you stand, if in life you feel like you flop more than you fly, if you feel like you fall short more than you take great strides, then welcome to the world of grace. Behold the beautiful bridge of God's mercy. And behold the relationship in which He gives you and invites you to not trust in yourself and not to trust in your accomplishments and not be discouraged by your failures because His big announcement to you is not serve, but let me serve you first. Not give, but let me give you most. Not do, but he points to the cross, to his son, and says, done. For our God, Paul says, he doesn't live in a temple that you can build. And he's not served with human hands as if he needs something of us. As if he's weak and whimpering and hoping that those people down there will do something so I can save them. Because our God is a great God. And our best works are not good enough. What good could we do to impress He who is good? So our response is not to work harder, but to trust, to believe, to walk away from the rock pile, and to be grateful. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will cross over the bridge to everlasting eternal life.